Hello and thank you for waiting um, for 12 days um, for the next update. Um, I won't bore you with the details but we're back and we are continuing once again with the readings um, of the projection of the astral body by Sylvan Muldoon and Hereward Carrington <clears throat> and we are on page 183 phantoms of the dead are often dominated by the stress of desire or habit um, so once again thank you very much for um, liking and sharing or commenting on my um, content and um, uh, thank you for subscribing I do appreciate you very much thank you uh, so thank you <coughs> please excuse me I'm going to try to get through this um, without any snuffles today Okay, so phantoms of the dead are often dominated by the stress of desire or habit. This is one of the reasons for haunted houses and haunted localities. Phantoms of the dead may have desire and habit so strongly embedded within them that they will continually steadfastly in their habits and conduct even after becoming conscious simply because the stress is there and they must work it off. It is the same stress of desire or habit or both which the phantom tries to work off when we sleep and knowing this we are able to force the subconscious will to move out of the phantom while we sleep by instilling a strong stress of desire or habit or both which we will come which will come to the surface of the subconscious mind during the hours of sleep while our physical body is usually incapacitated and the phantom will be liberated to work off the stress of habit or appease the desire. Phantoms of the dead for a time after entering the astral plane do not conduct themselves in a manner differing from projected phantoms of the living. Some remain unconscious for a time, others are conscious even before the astral cable snaps and others roam about in a dream or partially conscious. <clears throat> While in either the unconscious or partially conscious condition, the phantom is under the stress of habit or desire and does not deviate from it as long as the suggestion remains active. But once of desire and the routine of habit, yet as a matter of fact, the stress is so strong that the phantom in many instances loiters about its familiar haunts, submitting to the urge of the stress, even while conscious. After death, Habits are unbroken, desires are unappeased, and the stress of them remains. The phantom goes through the process of appeasing some desire which he had in the flesh or the habit to which he had been accustomed. The unconscious phantom sometimes moves material objects. You have been told that the way in which the subconscious will responds to the suggestion depends upon the shade of the suggestion. Under the stress of deep-rooted habit, routine, the subconscious will becomes, on some occasions, actually determined. It uses powerful motivity in every action, and this motivity, while performing a habit, is much more powerful than at, and, than at other times. This is the reason why phantoms of the dead, while under the stress of habit in their accustomed haunts, often move objects which their conscious wills could not move. It is the stress of suggestion, which is so powerful and deep-rooted in the subconscious mind that it produces a strong subconscious will response. The unconscious phantom, under the stress of working off a habit, can sometimes move things which another conscious phantom cannot move because the conscious will cannot produce the motivity, which is the subconscious will can produce and a single conscious suggestion is not as strong as a deep-rooted subconscious suggestion. Many haunted houses are thus easily accounted for. The phantom whose activities are detected there is under the stress of desire or habit and the motivity is so strong that detection by earthly beings residing there is brought about and the haunter may be the unconscious, partially conscious or conscious. Many haunted house investigators have noted that certain manifestations occur at certain times regularly. This is because the phantom is under the stress of habit. And here is an example. The haunter, sorry, a haunter under the stress of a desirably, of a desirable habit. I knew an old lady who lived in a room on the second floor of a house where she spent the last years of her earthly life. She had a habit during the last ten years of her life, of reading the Bible regularly. 
Every morning between four and five o'clock she would arise, take a squeaky old rocking chair, which she cherished, and read the Bible while she rocked back and forth, every rock of the chair producing a similar squeak. At five o'clock she would close her Bible, then go downstairs. This routine she kept up for ten years. Finally she passed out of earthly existence. The occupants who lived in the house after the old lady's death were awakened every morning about four o'clock and could hear the chair which the old lady had used squeaking as if someone were rocking back and forth in it. The story circulated that the house was haunted. Not only did occupants who lived there immediately after the old lady's death move out, but no one would ever move into the house after that. Although the people who moved out were not superstitious, so they said, and did not believe in spirits, they nevertheless insisted that they heard the chair squeaking regularly between four and five every morning. This is given merely to show how the stress of habit in the subconscious mind will grip the phantom, and further how strong motivity is under the stress of a desirable habit. The phantom was under the desire to read the Bible and under the habit of reading it regularly at a certain place. An early morning haunter. Here is another case which illustrates how the phantom turns to its regular habits. When projected, an old man, 75, lived with his son and his son's family, all slept on the upper floor of the house. The old man having a room of his own, the husband and wife a room of their own, and the two children likewise. <clears throat> the old gentleman was in the habit of rising early in the morning and lighting the stove downstairs. He did this regularly at 6.30 o'clock, and not because he was any un in any under any obligation to do so, but because he wanted to do it. One Sunday morning, at about this hour, the son awoke upstairs and heard the stove lids rattle on the stove downstairs. He remarked to his wife that his father, the old man, was lighting the fire. Nothing unusual in that. And about, about half an hour later, the son and his wife arose. Going downstairs, they found that the stove had not been lighted. That's not the right word. Had not been lit. But it does say lighted here. Still, they knew that they had heard the old man, or at least someone, rattling about the stove at 6.30. The wife going upstairs to the children's room, told them not to make a commotion when getting up, as their grandfather was still asleep in his room. But the children objected to this, saying that they had heard their grandfather go through the hall and downstairs and heard him rattling about the stove, with the children confirming their former belief that the old man was already up. The son and his wife went to the old man's room. He was lying there as if asleep. But the examination proved that he was dead. A doctor was immediately summoned and stated that the old man had been dead at least five hours. So they concluded that it could not possibly have been the old gentleman whom they had heard and whom the children had heard. Cases similar to this are numerous and on record. The projected phantom was under the stress of habit and the motivity in such a case is powerful. I shall come back to this subject of how the phantom may move physical objects later. The factor, innovation. <clears throat> in the list of factors which incite the subconscious will to move the astral body may be found innovation. There is no need to go into a study of this factor, for we already learned that the innovation, lack of cosmic energy, caused the astral to move farther out into the cosmic stream of energy during sleep. We have learned that subjects of nervous temperament move out more f quickly, farther and more easily. Enervation is really a bodily condition. It is an aid to projection of the astral body. Now if you repeat to yourself over and over again, I have energy, I have energy, I have energy, day after day, as some authorities maintain that you should do to promote projection, instead of aiding projection, you are actually binding your astral body tighter to the physical. For the more energy you store up in the less inclined will the astral condenser be to move, sorry, for the energy, sorry, for the more energy you store up, the less inclined will the astral condenser be moved out to a greater distance during separation. 
If the nervous temperament be the best suited to projection, then it is not inconsistent to say that to build up the energy is the best method of attaining projection. Surely it is. It is lack of nervous energy which makes the nervous temperament, and to build up one's energy by any means is the only is only to draw the subject farther away from the end desired. The astral body does not separate from the physical body at night uh, during sleep, but it has to because it has too much energy. But because sorry, but because it has not enough, that is the reason why we go to sleep. Sorry, let me just recap. <clears throat> The astral body does not separate from the physical body at night during sleep because it has too much energy, but because it has not enough, that is the reason why we go to sleep. If it were strength of will and accumulation of energy which cause projection of the astral body, the sick person would be unable to project, but this is precisely the opposite of the known facts. Now I have the greatest of respect for all of my contemporaries in this field, but I believe that in their theories of good health and accumulation of energy are honeycombed with inconsistencies, and I am dogmatic in my subconscious stress theory. Chapter 10. Um, we're on page 188. Determining the proper stress to use in developing. Now that we understand what it is that impels the subconscious will to move the body while we sleep, all that is necessary to do is to develop one of the factors strongly so that it will come to the surface or stay at the surface of the subconscious mind after we go to sleep. In choosing the factor one wishes to use, one should not select the first one he thinks of, but should first of all resort to analysis and see of it to be the factor suited to his individual case one which would not be too difficult to develop in the subconscious mind, one which would be in harmony with the laws of projection, and one which uh, <clears throat> sorry, and one which he has already strongly developed, instead of creating an entirely new one. Ask yourself questions such as following such as the following Have I a desire which I dream of appeasing frequently, or which grips me forcibly in my waking hours? Will it require movement of the astral body in order to appease it? Is it a sex desire? If so, do not use it. It will not permit passivity of the physical body. Is it a desire for revenge directed against someone? If so, do not try to develop it. Have I a habit which I like? Is it a desirable habit? Do I dream of it frequently? This merely shows you that it is strongly rooted in the subconscious mind and suggests itself while you sleep. Is it part of my routine? And do I dislike my routine, etc.? <clears throat> the object of asking oneself questions such as these is merely to enable one to determine which factor would be the best for development, the one which would fit your particular requirements best. If you have learned the requirements for astral projection, you will be enabled to select the factor more scientifically, so to speak. It is not for me to take dictate which factor you select in trying to develop but my advice would be to try first for several reasons first why go to the trouble of developing a habit of tenacious routine working probably weeks in impressing it strongly on the subconscious mind when you can impress thirst there in minutes in or in just a few hours with little effort Second, thirst must be appeased. The subconscious knows this and will resort to anything to get the body to water, so it will move the astral out of determination if it cannot move the physical. I shall give the formula later. Okay, so we're finishing on page 189 and we'll be going on to incapacity, the fundamental difference between astral projection and the physical somnambulism. Um, and I will look forward to speaking to you soon. Um, if I don't um, upload in the next few days, happy holidays and I hope you have a wonderful time. Thank you. Bye bye.